Good afternoon. I'm sorry, it's the last afternoon before the coffee break. So, um, we are going to talk about private lending, and um, I'm going to let my panel to introduce itself first. Hi, I'm Lukas, Lukas Pech from Golding. Golding is a Munich based funder fund. I'm focused on, on credit, so I'm going to add the LP perspective to that topic. Hi, um, my name is Amit Bari. I'm from Goldman Sachs Asset Management, and I co-lead our European direct lending business. Hi, my name is Henri Lusa. I'm Managing Director at Partners Group, leading our efforts in many uh, regions in Europe. So, um, we, the, the, the theme of our uh, panel is uh, the golden age of uh, direct lending. I was wondering, how did we get here? So, it was in the past 15 years, how did we get to, uh, to this hegemonic, uh, powerful asset class? What do you think? Sure, I can, I can kick off. Um, you know, I think in the sort of 15 years that I've been doing direct lending in Europe, um, you know, for the first 10 of those years, uh, the sort of size of companies that were more likely to use direct lending capital rather than going down the capital markets were disproportionately on the smaller side of companies. You know, you still had large companies do direct lending deals. You know, um, our first loan fund in 08 was about $10 billion. So we were, you know, always focused on the large cap segment. But what sort of evolved in the last sort of five years, even before the current market dislocation, is that larger and larger companies started using direct lending. And that had to do with the flexibility of the solution on offer, that had to do with the ease of execution, and candidly, that had to do with the fact that it just became a very credible alternative to the syndicated loan markets. So I think, you know, if you look at where direct lending has evolved in the last 15 years, you know, what's fascinating is just the kinds of companies, I mean, we had a uni tranche for a company with 300 million pounds of EBITDA last year in Europe, and that was the largest. And you know, that ongoing secular shift was in the, in, in the backdrop of a very favorable capital markets environment. So it, it wasn't a sort of short-term blip where you know, capital markets are dislocated and hence borrowers are going down this route. It was in the context of just a more secular structural shift. And then that obviously got turbocharged last year when you had the current dislocation in the market. So I think, you know, when we talk about direct lending entering its golden era, I think, you know, it's in that context. Do you have something to add, Henry, Henri? Or? No, I, I will agree. I mean, a lot has been said. Uh, I think what we've seen recently uh, in, let's say, H2 uh, last year is obviously a more challenging environment. Um, we, we say the direct lending market continued to win market share however has been even more cautious uh, we have seen across the market a reduction of ticket size uh, more diversification i mean diversification is really key sorry <laughs> um, which means that uh, uh, it's really about protection also on, on, on we will address legal documentation covenants how you protect uh, how you cope with this challenging environment, how you make sure the, the, the direct lending market uh, remains resilient. Look, no, I just want to want to add, if you think about the development over the last 10, 15 years, um, I think from, from an LP perspective, when we started investing, investments in senior credit in, in Europe with funds, I think initially the, the first couple of vintages, the the model always worked with an input interest rate of something like 9%. Um, that's, that was basically the input in the model, and then as an LP in an unlevered format, you get to six to seven, maybe maybe seven and a half net. Uh, I think over time, and until about a year ago, this number obviously came down significantly with, with basically LIBOR of zero plus 550, maybe six, uh, obviously, in a way, putting a bit of a burden on, on LPs. Um, and I think if I look at the environment now, which probably brings us to the current market environment, there are a lot of elements of you know coming back to the good old days in a way. Um, higher margins, higher total return, better documentation, potentially less competition. Um, which is uh, going back to the going back to the title, probably a very very good environment to be investing in. Okay, I, so you 
three have a very positive view on the, on the asset class, but um, uh, the, the, the headwinds are, take, are giving a toll to uh, all of us. And, uh, and uh, money is not cheap anymore. And um, uh, interest rates are high. So how you you going to do to, uh, to, face, to face the market? And how, where are you going to take re your resilience from? And yeah, are you, how are you going to face it? And are you going to change your DNA? Or um, are you going to just brace for impact? Hey, look, I think, um, you know, I, I can speak on my behalf and then, you know, Henry should comment, but I suspect it's similar. I think, you know, there is no sort of changing of the DNA. You know, I think the philosophy in our investing has very much been on downside protection and capital conservation. You know, I think, um, you know, every IC discussion we've had in the last decade has always assumed that next year is going to be the year of a very bad recession and, you know, how does the company perform in that? It just so happens that this year that might actually happen. But so I think, you know, if you look at the kind of sectors we're active in, and I think it's probably true of many other players, you know, they tend to be sectors less exposed to GDP volatility. They tend to be sectors less exposed to consumer-facing businesses. I mean, you know, the vast majority of our portfolio sits in healthcare services, software, or mission-critical business services where, you know, we haven't seen a huge demand slowdown. Okay, organic growth might not be high single digits, might come down to mid to low single digits. You know, there's some margin pressure that you face, but you're able to pass that through to your customers. So I think by virtue of the kind of deals um, that, you know, direct lending players have done, I think they should be less exposed to, um, you know, a macro softness. I think the one thing that will come in focus, though, is just cash flow, because a lot of capital structures were set up for a 0% rate environment, and a lot of businesses have seen their you know, coupons double or even more in some cases, um, depending on how much they had hedged or not. And so I think really the businesses that can you know, support that cash burden through you know, margin enhancements, cost savings, passing you know, costs through to customers, I think that will be important. And I think also, candidly, businesses that weren't over-levered at inception and had some headroom and might, might have grown in the last couple of years, I think those businesses uh, will also perform well. But I think, you know, so far, certainly from our standpoint, we're not seeing a broad-based slowdown in the portfolio. Um, I would say just growth is a bit lower than what we underwrote, which, you know, frankly, from a credit perspective, just gives us a bit more duration. All right. What do you think, Helen? Yeah, there's, there's a trade-off, uh, obviously, between higher returns for the private debt and the cost of the debt. So that has been uh, mentioned. Uh, I think we, we've seen leverage going down. I mean, we are asking a leverage to, to go down. I mean, whether it's by a half, half a turn or a turn. Uh, we're looking at better, let's say, protection. Ability to service debt is very key in our due diligence. Um, so that, that's clearly one point we have uh, observed. The other one is perhaps the emergence of a club transaction uh, for, for two reasons. I mean, potentially last year, uh, larger transactions have been financed with private uh, direct lending. Uh, and typically you will find, you, you have found like three, four, five, six, even more lenders sharing this financing. So that was more what we've seen at H1 last year. More recently, as I mentioned, people have reduced the ticket size, more diversification. So even for, for let's say, smaller uh, size, you, you, you can find two or three lenders uh, sharing the, the financing. I think people are getting used to uh, that, that, that phenomenon of, of clubbing. Uh, from a fundraising perspective, might, I mean, what we, the feedback we receive is that, uh, I mean, they obviously like people leading uh, transaction, but also they see sometimes overlap across their credit managers. But in, in that way, it, it's, there is a bit of DNA change, no? Because um, uh, direct lenders were always kind of, I want to be a sole lender, I want to be in charge, I want to be in control of what's going on. And now you're giving up a bit your power, uh, if power is the right word, by, uh, by sh sharing um, the financing. So uh, in that sense, you kind of adapt it in, uh, to the market and say, okay, uh, let's all work together. Yeah, look, I, I think there is a pragmatism to this as well, which is, you know, whilst it's great to be the sole lender, and, you know, we're sole lender in many businesses, I think, you know, the, one of the benefits of being in a club is that, you know, if you've got 
you know, two, three, four, five lenders, you know, everybody's pushing for a different point. You know, for someone it's purely the headline money terms, for someone it might be dog protections. You know, for the first time in the large cap market, we've seen maintenance covenants come back. Um, you know, let's see how long that lasts, hopefully. But, you know, what ends up happening in a club deal is that you do end up with sometimes a better solution. Now, conversely, to the point I think you're making, Francesca, you may not control the tranche, but you know, if you've got like-minded investors alongside you, and you know, eventually in European direct lending of scale, there's a handful of players and you know, people do know each other, then you know, whether it's in good times or bad times, you can work collaborative, you know, collaboratively both within the club, but then also with the borrower and get to the right, you know, get to the right outcome. Um, so you know, I think single lender deals were very fashionable in 2021, where also candidly, you know, everybody was flushed with funds and wanted to deploy. Um, you know, I think at this point in time where, you know, th th pe people are being a bit more balanced in their deployment, I think it ends up being a bit of a win-win. And, you know, unlike um, 0809, where for 18 months we didn't see any LBOs, you know, last year in Europe, post the summer, we saw a number of LBOs. You know, we ourselves did about four uni tranches and four or five uni tranches, and these are all done in a club fashion. So, you, you know, borrowers can finance deals even in this environment where there is no functional syndicated market. And I think that's also why you do need those club deals to get to the sort of one, one and a half billion dollar financings. Well, because I think, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, from an LP perspective, I think Golding, we always had the, the view when it comes to club deals that we don't want to invest with fund managers who and pay management fee to fund managers who then invest in other people's deals. So I think what's, what's critical for us is that we work with managers who own the deal, who do a lot of work, they do the due diligence, they know what they're getting into. Um, so in a way, I'm always skeptical and we, for a long time we, we bought into these, these theses of people need to control their deals. I think a lot of the stuff that you mentioned uh, is I, I see that and I can, I, can, I can very much live with it. Ultimately, what we want to have is a, a, a very strong deal in the portfolio, strong deals, a good portfolio, and a broadly diversified portfolio. And I think in the current market environment, accepting in a way that, that a couple of people who have worked intensely on the deal, who have brought something to the table in the negotiation, have pushed the document, that those people work together on a specific transaction, that's something we can very well live with. And, uh, and in, in that way, I think also our view has, has changed on that point a little bit. And just to illustrate, when I, when I discuss with the uh, advisors or capital market, head of financing, whatever you call it, I mean, they always tell me if we, if, I mean, in the past to raise 400, 500, 600 million of debt, we were talking to three to four lenders ended up with one or two, actually. Now they have to approach 10, 15 lenders. At the end of the process, they may get five term sheets. Those five term sheets are completely different with different requirements, requests. Uh, so to Amit's point a bit, at the end, they don't find necessarily a common denominator. And the, the final package is actually attractive because everyone gets something different. So you might see some uh, premium, I mean, not necessarily just on the pure economics, but on the legal documentation and protection. Whereas if you look at, let's say, smaller tranche, 100, 150 million to 100, I mean, there are, of course, more appetite to do the whole tranche. You will, for, let's say, a quality asset, quality credit, you will find people competing. There's still a lot of competition. And, um, you know, maybe there's some, always someone to undercut you uh, someone who has lost the last five uh, deals who really wants to do this, this, this transaction. So you, you still have a bit of both, and, and sometimes also local banks for lower leverage, a lower amount are, are also competing. Look, also the borrowers, right? I think the borrowers want to diversify their funding sources, right? They saw, you know, one of the shortcomings of a single lender deal is, you know, of course, if that lender is out of capital or for whatever reason, you know, you can't align with them, you know, you take a bit more risk. So I think, you know, the borrower's perspective is is is, is also sort of important when you think about this. But just a one quick question, uh, uh, a parenthesis for uh, on the on the clubs. When it comes to the right refinancing moment, and you have to refinance or or, or do a little add-on, uh, who's going to do it? The whole club, or, or uh, is is it not like uh, an open uh, an open gate to 
to fight so I don't, I, uh, or conflict in a way? Look, I think the starting position for some of these is that everybody comes in with their pro rata, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, most players are pragmatic and rational, and I, I don't think they would use that opportunity to necessarily undercut the others. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we'll sort of see as these capital structures evolve, because we're at the beginning of a journey, I think, in this market. Yeah. Um, and it's going to become much more institutionalized, much more, you know, broader than sort of five, six years ago where, you know, for this size of company, going back to the point I made at the beginning, that for this size of companies, y y you know, you didn't really have a lot of direct lenders that were active. And that's kind of changed in the last five years. Yeah. I think when we do our due diligence with managers, I think that's one point that, that we look into. I think if we accept the fact that we, we are in a lot of club deals, we want to understand what are the hopefully like-minded investors that, that a credit manager would work with? Do we see a certain alignment? Do we see the, these managers set up in a similar way so that we, I mean, we can deduct in a way that, that there will be a, a common approach to es especially those situations that you are mentioning? Yeah. That's important for us. One last thing, I mean, we mentioned obviously you need a club sometimes to close the transaction, but the, the spirit and the, I mean, what the, the borrower and, and sponsor wants to achieve is to make sure they have also dry powder in the future yeah, yeah. To, fi to finance uh, follow on or other, let's say, additional uh, capex or acquisition line. Uh, so that's very important for them uh, without having to re-educate uh, new lenders who will come with a different requests to reopen the documentation. Having said that, at the moment, it's quite frequent that uh, if the deal is two years or three years old, that in any case, the, on top of, let's say, better economics, you also reopen some of the legal documentation to make it as close as possible to the current market. Uh, I have a, qu a question for you, Lucas. You, you mentioned uh, diversification, but from an LP standpoint, if you have a club and you invested in I don't know, these five lenders, and you end up having the same, uh, well, issuer for five different lenders, and maybe you also invested in the private equity that gave the equity, and then where is the diversification there? That's a good, very good point. <laughs> no, I think, um, to be honest, across our portfolio, that hasn't happened a lot. There is obviously the risk that this might happen, we are, we are not invested with every manager, so uh, knock on wood, we hopefully won't get exposure to, to a same deal through more than one or two to a manager, but, but ultimately there is a risk. On the flip side, I would say um, a typical mandate that we manage or a typical fund that we manage has 1,000, 1,200 individual transactions. I think when, it, when you think about the exposure to a single name, for us, it's probably more critical if we have one fund who has a relatively concentrated portfolio of about maybe 10, 50 names, because then the individual deal is quite big. And if such a deal is then also a part of a, of, a, of a club where we have uh, exposures through different managers as well, that, that would be critical. But I think overall, with, with the big numbers that we that we have in the portfolio, I think the the risk of an overexposure to an individual deal is is a bit remote. I understand. Is that a, the, a conversation you guys have with LPs or when you do clubs or is we, it? We, a, a, we do, we do, and uh, I mean, obviously, we're also trying to limit the, the number of uh, clubs. I mean, we we're trying to chase sole or, or, or call it. At least we already have uh, uh, fifty percent of the transaction. Uh, we, but we have it, we're having this discussion uh, as we speak. I mean, people are looking at the portfolio. Of course, he uh, recognized some names where we, we have uh, team up with our friendly competitors. Uh, having said that, I mean, first of all, our diversification in our products are, are quite high. I mean, we're looking at uh, 40 to 60 position in a fund. Mm -hmm. So if you if you take the the manager, I mean, the fund manager approach on one level up. I mean, uh, even if they have let's say, two lenders sharing some of the position, uh, I would be surprised if they have more than 5%, 7% uh, uh, overlapping. Yeah, look, I think on our side, again, you know, the fund itself is diversified, so similar number of positions, you know, we sort of put a concentration limit at 2%, 2.5%. And then I think, you know, one of the interesting themes, just going back to another topic, which is sort of deal flow, 
you know, what we've seen last year is the majority of our deals are coming from our existing portfolio. You know, we've got a lot of, we've got over 100 names in our European direct lending portfolio and between, you know, add-on acquisitions, change of control transactions, you know, the odd refinancing, the, you know, increasingly maturity wall kind of opportunities, which I think will come more and more, you know, that's driving the majority of our deal flow. And, you know, these are companies that, you know, we've been a lender to in some cases for a decade, in some cases to three or four buyouts, right? Because 70% of the European P market tends to be secondary. So, you know, these companies have been in private equity ownership for long. So, you know, when we think about asset concentration and just, you know, how comfortable are we with the credits, you know, we come with that incumbency and that knowledge of the business, which I think um, is very helpful from an LP standpoint. I think hopefully they would see it as one, you know, we've, we've known for a while and, you know, we, we understand the risks and the opportunities. I understand. And um, so we, up until maybe pre-COVID and, and COVID, there was um, a kind of like a cowboy attitude from your part, like high leverage, I mean, in a nice way I say that, high leverages, covenant light, if, uh, and does now, do you have to uh, rethink everything? And now, like, uh, are the covenants back even for the big clubs? Uh, do you, have you capped your leverages? Or, uh, or are you still kind of like super um, uh, flexible in a way you were before? Look, I would say on the, on the covenants, I would say, you know, we have to be pragmatic because in the sort of size and quality of businesses we as an institution are investing in, when the capital markets open up, that will also be an alternative for them, right? And so, you know, at the moment, if you looked at kind of deals done pre-Christmas, most of the unit tranches, even for large businesses, had covenants. Um, I think it would be a lie to say that's going to be there forever. I think you have to be a bit balanced about it. I think, you know, I think the way we look at it is it's really about the credit underwrite, the kind of asset, the kind of owner, the sector it operates in, the size and the scale. We focus on that. On top of that, obviously, you want to get the best document you can. Yeah. But if I had to choose between like the best document on the planet and and a good credit, like you know, personally, I I, I know where my you fair know, point. Where my bet would yeah. sit. Um, so you, look, you have to be pragmatic about it. But at this point in time, the docs have definitely tightened. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we also have to keep an eye out for what happens to the capital markets and when they come back. Yeah. Yeah. Is no, yeah, um, I share this position. I mean, we, it's true. It's a fact. We have more bargaining power at the moment. Uh, we can ne negotiate better docs, uh, lower leverage for a higher return. Uh, having said that, we know the, the market will be back at some point in time. And uh, from, from a sponsor or borrower's perspective, then they will be able to refinance or we will have to reprice or change the documentation. So there's on our side at the moment also protecting our return, our current, uh, let's say, uh, financing by, by focusing a lot on this uh, prepayment protection, MFN. I mean, that, that's pretty important at the moment because market will at some point come back. Yeah, of course. Lucas, you want to say something? Yeah, no, just, just to add, I think from an LP perspective, obviously, uh, the one thing that I believe stands out also compared to to the COVID crisis where there has, there has also been a, a bit of a tightening of, of documentation, et cetera. I think the question on, on leverage is probably one that I pay a lot of attention to mm -hmm. with a given cash flow and, yeah. a, and a kind of an, a floating interest rate and a an high interest rate environment. Obviously, the debt amount that a business can, can manage and bear is, is lower. So that's something where I think this is at least for as long as this high interest rate environment is, is there, we will see that in new transaction, which is from an LP perspective, certainly a, a very positive thing. Yeah. Uh, investing in with, with high interest and low leverage is that <laughs> exactly what you want. Uh, I mean, the question is ultimately how, how will transaction happen? What, what, what can you do to bridge potentially the gap? Yeah. Let, let, let's touch a, a quick point on portfolio management, I guess. Um, we're going to try to avoid as much uh, defaults as possible uh, in this uh, difficult environment. Uh, so what's, um, what's the new skills <laughs> and what's uh, your new tricks for portfolio management uh, at the moment? Look, I think, I think the first is just basics, which is staying close to the portfolio, right? If you're the you know, largest or the control or this, you know, 
joint largest in capital structure, you know, you should you should have good dialogue with management and owners and just making sure, you know, you understand, you know, any signs of softening, you know, could that get worse, um, you know, down the road. I think, you know, the, the sort of businesses we're lending to tend to be pretty resilient. They often tend to be some of the best companies that have transacted in the last few years with the highest purchase prices. So there's a lot of scrutiny from the owners, right? Because for a lot of these companies, you know, these are the biggest positions and, you know, all the big mega buyout funds. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of support from the, you know, for, for, from the owners themselves. And I think from our standpoint, it's just making sure that, you know, there's sort of, it's not binary, it's not like everything is well and then there's a default. I think there's a gray zone in the middle where, you know, you may not have a default, but you, you, you know, you're spending time with management and, you know, on the odd deal where there's a lot of M&A going on and you feel like it's softening, maybe you tell management and the owners that, you know, maybe it's time to slow down a bit on the M&A. It's sort of that, you know, that soft influence and dialogue with all stakeholders. I think that should avoid 90, 95% of the situations. And then of course, you know, if, if something does it default or you know you, you you do have a proper restructuring you know of course you have to deal with it but at this point you know we're not seeing i mean you know there are one or two idiosyncratic issues but there's not a broad based um you know slowdown in the portfolio is it the same for you Henri? yeah i mean the default rates are all time low at the moment so uh, it's fair to say that we expect them to to increase whether it's four five percent uh, on the other side we think our recovery rate and protection is currently quite strong um, but there's this real focus now also in, in management skills, ability to cope with the current environment, uh, inflation, uh, uh, protect your, your margin, ability to, to, to pass on price increases, uh, for example, uh, deal with a, any supply chain issue you may have near showing. Uh, so really ability to react, flexibility of the business model, uh, manage your cost base. Uh, also, we look at, of course, geography, uh, ge geopolitical tensions. Yeah. So here, uh, really, we, we always start sponsor management skills uh, even more than, than before. Um, yeah. No, just to, to add the, the perspective of the broader portfolio, it's, yeah. it's similar. I think we see s throughout the portfolio probably sales growing faster than, than EBITDA, so margin a little bit under pressure, but with a, with a growing EBITDA, that's... I think it's something we can very well live with. I think the specifics of this potential recession coming is that it's coming for six or nine months now. Yeah. So I think there is an element across the portfolio where, where people, you know, they brace themselves, they're prepared for something larger to come. So the question is how deep a recession will actually be. Yeah. And I mean, I see, I'm looking at the time, I see we only have like one minute left, but can we just quickly touch upon um, the, dif like the difference of sectors and the difference of geographies? Are there, uh, for instance, um, is it, are there geographies where it's more difficult to do deals? Um, I don't know, maybe the UK or maybe somewhere else. And, and on sectors, uh, everybody's chasing fantastic software companies, but um, the competition is gonna be fierce. And um, how, how, what can you invent uh, to, um, to, Im to manage to invest in companies that are not necessarily all chased after? <laughs> I think, look, I think from a country standpoint, um, you know, the UK considerably slowed down in the second half of last year. You know, following some of the political uncertainty, we just didn't see many, if any, sizable sponsor transactions. So that slowed down the pace of investing. You know, broadly, and actually conversely, last year we, we had a very busy year in Italy. There were, you know, some very high quality Italian names. I th you know, I think what we try to do to avoid too much country exposure is, whilst there are some domestic champions, like in the UK, we have some portfolio companies which are maybe 100% UK, but those tend to be very dominant in their market position. But then a lot of our UK companies tend to be very global, right? They might be headquartered in the UK, but the underlying demand driver and the underlying consumer footprint or customer footprint, I should say, is, is quite global. You know, I think on the sector piece, um, you're right, actually, for us, software is a little bit smaller than business services, because I do suspect that, you know, off, off the three or four sort of resilient sectors, software does tend to get a lot, you know, get a lot of crowding. Um, you know, look, it's competitive, but again, you know, we sort of look at our portfolio and our incumbent positions as one of the sources of, 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 a, of an edge. Um, and then, you know, you pick, you know, you pick your battles, try to spot things early, and then if you have good relationships with the borrowers, you can leverage those to you know, um, create opportunities. Mm. 
Henri, you have anything to add? No? No. <laughs> uh, we are at the end of the panel. Is there anything you wanted to add, something to wrap up? Do you, did you say everything you want? Did you get off everything on your chest or everything? Any questions from the audience? Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the panel. It was fantastic. And uh, have a nice day.